The portion of God's word that we'll focus our hearts on this morning comes from our first reading from Exodus chapter 17. Let's begin with prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We've all been there. The dry mouth, sandpaper tongue, the, the stickiness in your throat. Maybe even in extreme cases, the, the headaches or the blurred vision or, or even fainting. And I think that's why the imagery that Jesus uses in his word today is such a compelling visual. Because from the beginning of time, everyone, no matter when they lived or where they lived or how they lived, everyone knows what it's like to be thirsty. Because everyone thirsts. Whether you just finished running the, the Gate River Run or you just finished mowing your lawn in the summer Florida heat, whether you're sitting in a movie theater with a big bucket of popcorn or whether you're preaching a sermon, we all have experienced that, that nagging thirst, maybe even sometimes a desperate thirst for water. And there's a reason for that. Because water is absolutely fundamental for life. All of the biochemistry of life depends on water. And all of the, the functions of our body that we need to live and survive require water. And that's the reason why you can only live without water for maybe two or three days. And that's also the reason that God has designed our bodies, wired our bodies with kind of this, this built-in monitoring system to make sure we have the proper amount of water that we need to live and function. We get thirsty. And so because water is elemental for life and because everyone thirsts, we might feel like the, the Israelites, the people in our sermon text for today, their actions aren't all that egregious. In Exodus 17, we find that the people of Israel have been set free from their slavery in Egypt by God for a handful of months at this point. And they're continuing their trek through the wilderness as they make their way to the, the land that God had promised to give them. Exodus 17 begins this way. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Now for a community of over half a million people, not even including all the livestock that were also with them, not having accessible water was a deadly problem. Who wouldn't feel a little bit grumpy or maybe a little grumbly or upset or, or fearful in a situation like that? Except the people of Israel really had no reason that they needed to be afraid or grumble in this moment because of everything they had experienced up to this point. See, while they were still in slavery in Egypt, they had seen God's power on display as he poured out plague after plague on their Egyptian captors. They'd seen God's grace on display, and the angel of death had passed over their lamb's blood painted doorposts, sparing them. And they saw God's judgment carried out as the angel of death struck down the firstborn in every Egyptian household. And while they were in the wilderness, they saw God's power to rescue them, as God had parted the waters of the Red Sea and allowed the whole Israelite nation to walk through safely on dry ground and then brought the waters crashing back down to destroy the pursuing Egyptian army. In the wilderness, they had seen God's power to provide for all of their needs, as he had taken bitter, undrinkable water and transformed it into to beautiful, sweet, thirst-quenching water. They had seen God's power to provide for all their needs as he brought flocks of quail to give them meat and protein, as he made manna, bread, that just appeared on the ground every single morning to provide for their needs. Over and over and over again up to this point, the people of Israel had seen God use his miraculous power to provide for their needs. And so it would seem that even at Rephidim, where there was no water for this huge community of people, that they shouldn't have been afraid, they shouldn't have been grumbling, they should have been throwing their arms around each other in reassurance and saying, don't worry, God's going to provide everything that we need just like he has been the whole time. But they don't. Instead, 
as their fear and their anger starts to rise, they start grumbling against Moses. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? They're so angry, they're so fearful that they now move, they're going to stone Moses for bringing them to this point. And Moses has to rebuke them for putting the Lord to the test. Which means that basically their mindset was, unless we have water, we can't really know for sure whether God is really with us. If he gives us water, then maybe we'll trust in him. So rather than trusting in God, they were putting God to the test. And it's understandable that they were thirsty. Everybody thirsts. But the fact is they were thirsting for the wrong kind of water. They were thirsting for the kind of water that couldn't actually meet their greatest need. The same thing was true about the woman, the Samaritan woman that Jesus meets at the well. Sure, she comes to the well to draw some physical water to quench her physical thirst. But as Jesus continues the conversation with this woman and peels back the layers in in her life, we see what she's really thirsting for. Through his penetrating question, Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter as he tells her, go call your husband and come back. And in that, we find out what she was really thirsting for. Love, acceptance, and commitment. Only with a long path behind her of relational wreckage from five failed marriages and a current live-in boyfriend, we see that she had been pursuing what she had been thirsting for with all the wrong sources. She had been pursuing that love and acceptance and commitment from a bunch of things that were just making her more thirsty. And so the question for us is, if Jesus met you at that well, what would he tell you to go and bring back? If you were out there in the wilderness with the Israelites in Rephidim, the lack of what would send you into a spiral of anger and grumbling and doubting of God? See, just as everyone has a a biological thirst for water, so also everyone has a psychological thirst for certain things in our lives. Maybe like the woman at the well, you thirst for love and commitment. Maybe you thirst for approval and acceptance and validation. Maybe you thirst for this sense of identity that gives your life direction and purpose. Maybe you thirst for peace and rest and security. Whatever it is that you're thirsting for, just like water gives us this this unquenchable thirst to have it, so also those things in our lives that we're thirsting for lead us to have this this nagging and sometimes downright desperate need to have those things in our lives. And that's not a bad thing. The fact is God wired us to have this deep thirst for just those things. But the problem comes when we try and quench our thirst for those things with all the wrong kinds of water. The Samaritan woman at the well was trying to quench her thirst for love and commitment through a bunch of sinful, broken human relationships. The people of Israel were trying to quench their need for peace and security by testing God with physical water instead of just trusting in his promises. And so again, the question turns back to you. What is it that you are guzzling down in your life as you try to quench your thirst? Maybe like the woman at the well, You try and quench your thirst for love, but you're doing it with a whole bunch of relationships and lifestyles that are so far from God-pleasing. Maybe you're a workaholic and you spend all of your time chasing after that, that thirst for security and peace with a bigger paycheck, chasing after that thirst you have for identity and purpose and value in your life by working your way up the corporate ladder or making a name for yourself in the business but in the process, you're actually removing yourself from the things that are really important in your life. Maybe your thirst for feelings of pleasure or joy or at least to ease the pain and the struggle of your life has brought you into addiction to substances or sex or screens. Maybe your thirst for approval and acceptance makes you a people pleaser who does and says whatever everyone thinks they want to hear from you to do whatever you feel like will make people like you the most 
adopting the opinions and the mindsets and the worldviews of the prevailing culture as your own opinions and mindset and worldview. Maybe your thirst for validation motivates you to surround yourself with people who will say what you want to hear, but not necessarily what you need to hear. Whatever it is that you're thirsting for in your life, the fact is that because each of us have a sinful nature inside of us, that often leads us to try and quench our thirst for those things with all the wrong resources. And in fact, as we pursue those things, they're often just making us that much thirstier because those things are not quenching our thirst, they're leading us away from the only thing that can quench our thirst. And there's lots of things in the world that might taste good, right? If you're mowing the lawn in the summer Florida heat, when you come inside, an ice-cold beer tastes better than just about anything in the world. Or if you are at your desk at work in that mid-afternoon, mid-week lull, that fourth cup of coffee hits just right. If you're sitting down for dinner at a burger place, that fountain Coke, that first sip, makes you go, ah. They taste good, but they're not going to quench your thirst. Because alcohol and caffeine and sugar, they're actually going to make you thirstier than quench your thirst. Because There's only one thing that can truly quench your thirst, and that's what God has designed our bodies to need. We need water to have our thirst truly quenched. And the same thing is true spiritually. Everyone thirsts, but there's only one that can quench our thirst. And that's what Jesus tells to the Samaritan woman at the well. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There's only one type of water that can truly quench our thirst and meet our greatest need. Living water. The water of life. And God knew that that was the kind of water that the people of Israel needed so desperately. And that's why despite all their grumbling, all their testing of God, all their anger against God's representative, God still instructs Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. I will stand there before you at the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. And so we see that just as he had before, once again, God provides for the physical needs of his people through his miraculous power. With the same staff of Moses that God had used to show his mastery over the water of the the Nile River as he turned it into blood. The same staff that he'd used to show his mastery over the waters of the Red Sea by driving them apart. He uses that same staff to again show his mastery over water. As through the, the representative that the people of Israel wanted to stone, God brings forth the water that they needed from stone. And not just a a little small trickle coming out of the rock, but enough water to meet and quench the thirst of over half a million people and all of their livestock. This is an amazing miracle that God does in the wilderness. And we see who it is that does the miracle as God tells Moses, I will stand there before you. And so God carries out this amazing miracle, bringing water out of solid rock for that many people And he does it, yes, to quench their physical thirst so they can live. But even more importantly, he does it to quench their their spiritual thirst. To give them the living water that they needed for eternal life. You see, the rest of Scripture makes that point clear for us. In Psalm 95 that we sang part of this morning, God tells us this. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. And at the end of that psalm, he warns us, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, at Massa in the desert. That's where these things take place in Exodus 17. Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, at Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. In 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes, uh, recaps a lot of the Israelites' history as they wandered in the wilderness as a warning. He says the Israelites all drank from the same spiritual the Israelites all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the same spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock 
was Christ. See, God brought forth miraculous water from a rock, but not just to meet their, spirit, their physical needs for water, to quench their thirst. He brought forth that water from the rock to point them ahead to the living water who would truly quench their thirst and meet their greatest need. The same rock that offered living water to that woman at the well in Samaria. Jesus Christ. It is only through him that our thirst can be quenched. See, the fact is, water is absolutely necessary for life, and Jesus is absolutely necessary for eternal life. Like we said, God has wired us with this, this inner deep thirst for things like peace and rest and love, and nothing in this world can quench your thirst for those things better than Jesus. No one can quench your thirst for peace and love like Jesus can. As he says, in, as Paul writes in Romans, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And nothing can quench your thirst to feel valuable, to have an identity and a purpose for your life like Jesus can. Jesus who saw you as so incredibly valuable that the Holy Son of God was willing to suffer the punishments of hell for you. That's how valuable you are to God. And through that valuable sacrifice for the valuable you, he gave you an identity as a child of God. And through that identity, you have an eternal purpose to live a life that glorifies God, a life that praises him, and a life that shares living water with all the thirsty souls around you in your life. See, the fact is, because of all of our chasing after so many things that, that don't quench our thirst but actually make us thirstier, we have no merit, we don't deserve that living water should be given to us any more than those Israelites with all their grumbling and groaning and complaining against God deserve to have that water pour forth from the rock. But in both cases, God in his grace and mercy gives to his people the water that we need. This week as I was preparing for the sermon, I, I listened to a podcast, a secular podcast about thirst, looking at it from the scientific perspective. I came away with some interesting insights they didn't say this, but we obviously understand. God is the one that created our bodies like this. But our brains are wired in a way so that if your, the amount of water in your body or the content of water in your body shifts even just a little bit, just 1%, that automatically triggers your brain to take action so that you can get the water that you need. And we do that subconsciously without even having to give intentional thought to it. Just think of how often you're sitting at your desk, you've got a water bottle on your desk at work, how often you kind of subconsciously reach out and grab it and take a sip. Our brains are wired to get the water that we need when it senses that we need it. And we understand that our bodies, for reasons in many ways unknown to science, our bodies give off certain uh, symptoms that exhibit our need for water. The fact that you get a little bit irritable or feel lethargic, or maybe even get a headache or have blurred vision, or even have seizures, those symptoms point out the fact that you are growing dehydrated and that you need water in your system. Have you ever thought that God has also designed our bodies so that there are certain symptoms that become exhibited in our lives if we've become spiritually dehydrated from the living water? If you find yourself constantly feeling angry or stressed, or hopeless, or helpless. If you are constantly feeling depressed, or anxious, or unloved. If you feel like your life is constantly feeling hopeless, and valueless, and purposeless, then might God just be giving you some symptoms to show you that you're spiritually dehydrated from the living water. That recently you haven't maybe been consuming enough of the living water and his promises that you are forgiven and loved, that you have peace with God, that you have easement from all of your guilt, that God has a plan for all of the things that happen in your life. I think so. And so drink down that water. When you're feeling those things, drink the water that has been given for you. 
Drink down the living water and the promises of Jesus to ease your pain, to ease your fear, to ease your guilt and shame. Drink it down. Drink it down with a spirit of faith that longs with this desperate, insatiable thirst for the living water like a guy who's been wandering in the desert for two days and comes across an oasis. May God give us by the faith worked in us by the Spirit this, this monitoring system that knows with every change, with every shift that takes place in our lives that we need to be filled up with the living water of Jesus and the Word of God. The fact is, a lot of those people that tasted the miraculous water from the rock at Rephidim, they still were looking to quench their thirst in a lot of other sources. Rather than trusting in God and his promises, they were still looking for something different. And we see the result. Paul warns God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. See, they had the living water, but they pushed it away for something else. Compare that, though, with the Samaritan woman. This woman who had spent so many years of her life feeling even more and more thirsty as she chased after all these different things that couldn't quench her thirst. That is until she came face to face with the living water who revealed himself as the only way that all of her thirst could be quenched. What did she do then? A simple verse. She left behind her water jar. She left behind her water jar and she went back into the city where she had come from and she told everyone that she met about the water of life that quenches all of her thirst. See, all of those things that she had been chasing after, all that stuff that she had been trying to quench her thirst with, she didn't have any need for that anymore. She left her water jar behind because she knew that all of her thirst could only be quenched in the good news of a Savior, her Savior Jesus. And friends, the same thing is true for you. Whatever water jars you are carrying around on your shoulders that are just weighing you down and making you even more thirsty, leave those things behind and drink deeply from the one who quenches all of your thirsts, the one who meets our greatest need, the water of life, our Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen.